go us and here we go. Welcome to another episode of the Good Listening To Show. Your life and times with me, Chris Grimes. The storytelling show that features The Clearing, where all good questions come to get asked and all good stories come to be told. And where all my guests have two things in common. They're all creative individuals and all with an interesting story to tell. There are some lovely storytelling metaphors. A clearing, a tree, a juicy storytelling exercise called 54321, some alchemy, some gold, a cheeky bit of Shakespeare, and a cake. So it's all to play for. So yes, welcome to the Good Listening To Show, your life and times with me, Chris Grimes. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we shall begin. Oh, yes, indeedy doody. Welcome, welcome, thrice welcome to a very exciting day here in the Good Listening To, your life and times with me, Chris Grimes, clearing... Look who I have snagged, ready to be tagged in my Zoom hole. It is none other than the wonderful Scottish Aberdonian, I think you are, wildlife filmmaker and presenter. And um, the wonderful man that is Gordon John, I think you'll find, I know you know your name, but I do too. <laughs> Gordon John Buchanan, MBE in the clearing. You are extremely... Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And how's morale? How's your story of the day? I know you're in France en route back from Zimbabwe. Go you. Yes, I'm, I'm not an Aberdonian. Other oh. other coast. I'm a he Hebridean Scotsman. Dole. Sorry about that. I was going to slap somebody called Dave Stewart later on <laughs> because he told me you were Aberdonian. So, yes. And just checking your sound is OK there. You snagged slightly. Can you? Um, so, yes. Um, um, uh, that sounds OK. <laughs> Yes, it's it's come back. The joys and, and well, the joys of Zoom and welcome to my Zoom hole. You'll be relieved to know it's not called welcome to my Zoom hole. It's actually, the, you know, the life and times of me, Chris Grimes. And I'm going to curate you, if I may, uh, Gordon Buchanan, through the storytelling scape of a clearing. Then we shake your tree to see which storytelling uh, apples fall out. Also, it, it didn't escape me in researching you, which I thoroughly enjoyed, that you are a patron for Trees for Life. So I'm particularly interested to shake your tree. That's about the preservation of the Caledonian forest in the Highlands. Um, you've done such wonderful programmes. I almost don't know where to begin. Polar Bear Family and Me, Cheetah Family and Me, Snow Wolf Family and Me. And, and this is, if I may, the equivalent of, um, well, I suppose my programme is Gordon Buchanan and Me. And this is the equivalent of me, I suppose, hoiking a tent in your garden and then just stalking you and your family for three weeks. <laughs> Well used to it. Well used to it. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. But it's only 45 <laughs> minutes. So, yes, um, you just you're on your way back from Zimbabwe. Do you want to just tell us a bit more about that to start with? Yeah, it, I mean, obviously, sort of international travel or all travel has been severely curtailed in the last um, year and a half. Um, but things have started to pick up again. You know, I'm uh, for a lot of people, I suppose, maybe life looks as if it's going back to normal. But because my career um, depends a lot on international travel, it's been a little bit of, um, yeah, pubs, pubs opening weren't so much of a concern for me and restaurants and, you know, gymnasiums opening. But actually being able to travel again uh, has been good. So, yeah, I spent a month in Zimbabwe. I'm currently quarantining in France and then I should be allowed to re-enter Scotland on the 4th of October. Wonderful. So, so how long before you can get back home? Because I know this is quite a, a circuitous route for you. Um, I've got another another week, but there's a lot of, um, I don't know, uncertainty. I realise that actually, you know, I'm just double checking all of the rules and regulations. One, that I can get on a plane and two, that they'll let me in the country when I when I get there. Um, so these are things ordinarily in the past you didn't have to, to worry about. But at the yes. moment, you know, it, it's it's just another one of those sort of little COVID pains that, yeah, yes. you have to be doubly sure that all and, and things are changing so quickly. Um, but I should all all being well and good. I should be back home within a week. And we're catching at a good time in the sense that you've also got a forthcoming tour coming up and there'll be a deliberate invitation for you to go as hard as you like on your URLs to tell us where the, uh, the tour is going to be. Great. I've noticed I'm based in Bristol. I noticed you're coming to Bristol in February. So if I may, at some point, I'll get to shake you by the hand as well. Hurrah. 
So uh, one question I like to start with actually is, is, is how's morale? What's your story of the day? So how would you like to answer that? Um, morale is, I think kind of my module meter is at 50%. I'm in Barrett's, um, the sun is shining. I'm overlooking, you know, a, a wonderful beach. But I'm by my, I'm by myself, and I'm really just killing time until I can get back home to to my family. So as sort of as as wonderful as it may seem, the reality is as I don't as beautiful as this place is, I don't want to be here. Uh, I understand. <laughs> I want I want to be home. I've been away for a month, um, and that is the only drawback of of my line of work is a time away from um your my sort of loved ones. So yes. yeah, at morale is sort of yeah. I mean, it's better than hotel quarantine, that's for sure. Yes, good choice, going to Biarritz near a beach by the sound of it. Lovely. Also, one of the more poignant things about you as a filmmaker, which I so enjoy, obviously you need incredible patience, courage, courage because of the polar bear stuff and the cheetahs stuff we all know, but also the solitude that you have to endure and the patience in what you're doing. But you do rather poignantly, occasionally, intermittently land in that you're really missing your wife and children. So that's a lovely, it's humanity that binds us all, but that's always a lovely thing to observe in the programmes that you've made over the years. Yeah, I get I get into trouble if I don't mention that. So um, yeah, it, it might, no, it is, it is genuine. <laughs> I think it's um, it's it's quite a self-serving occupation or passion. This this job, and and I get a lot out of it personally. But ultimately, it, it makes life a lot more difficult for for my family and for my my friends um, who who would all prefer to see a little bit more of me. I think at times, of course. Yes. And, and your own story, I've really enjoyed researching, not, not least what I knew of you and my admiration for you and your programmes. Um, you were actually working in a restaurant, I think, as a young teenager when um, you were in, it was the wife of Nick Gordon. Is that correct? And it was that restaurant that then got you an introduction to Nick Gordon. Then it all sort of began from there. Yeah, that's how it started. I think you know, the secret to the success of wildlife films and or filming wildlife uh, or wildlife photography is being in the right place at the right time and that's how I got started. I happened to be working in the right restaurant at the right time uh, and being I suppose being the right person uh, and I landed the opportunity of a lifetime really sort of, sort of snatched from um, sixth year at school uh, and became an assistant to a wildlife cameraman called Nick Gordon and that's yeah that's how it how it started. I mean I could have easily been working in a different restaurant in the same town and never made those connections but that's yeah that's how it all worked out and I'm very glad it did work in that way. And I, I love that through line throughout your career of being in the right place at the right time because of course catching the shot that you are incredibly patient for uh, I'm not sure how much of the filming you did for yourself of the of the polar bear family and me but that was the most extraordinary series of sequences and the snow wolves I mean, I've just I've just bathed in what you've been doing for so long but it is about the patience you know, and, and the longevity of waiting for the shot, which must be so mm. profound for you. Well, I've, all, I've said this quite often that it's not it's not really about patience, because when it comes to, you know, waiting for someone to, of if you're on hold on a phone line, waiting to speak to your energy provider, <laughs> I don't have much patience if I'm standing in a queue <laughs> and there are people dithering in front of me yes. I don't have that much patience um but when in the in the animal world I've, I've got a good level of optimism I think that you you know with experience you learn when you're a, a gut you have a gut feeling that you're in the right place um and it's just a matter of time hopefully that before you see the things that you the behavior or the animal that you're there to to see so it's yeah it, I always think it's optimism that sees yes. you through and not so much um, patience because yeah as I said other aspects of my life I'm not that patient at all by the way that's so related <laughs> there's a mantra in my family which is patience is a virtue daddy doesn't have and so I can <laughs> so you're talking about professional patience which is what we admire and how it comes out in your work obviously um, also, if I may, just before we get on the open road of the, the structure, in your WhatsApp photograph, I, I was lucky enough to interview Alistair Fothergill recently, and his was a, um, a picture of him near an albatross nest out in the Arctic uh, somewhere, mm -hmm. the tundra. Um, your WhatsApp photograph looks to me like you are in a Bronte-esque or Dickensian top hat. I think <laughs> stood next to a very young, if I'm right, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but Olivia Coleman, it looks like. 
Um, I, I've forgotten. I think I put that WhatsApp um, photo up just as a sort of uh, a bit of a panic. And yeah, that was when we went on a trip to um, Bronte country. So we were in the we were in the um, the Bronte Museum, ah. and they had a selection of of um, of uh, attire that you could dress up in. So yes, my wife, myself, and my two kids, we put on ah. some some period costume. And I, I genuinely, I think. I would love if they brought top hats back. I think I'd quite like to wear a top hat or a bowler hat. Um, but sadly, yeah, I, I think it might be just for sort of museums and um, random photos. Lovely. And if I can just commend you in a top hat, I've called you a silver fox, I think, once, even immediately before we started recording or during it. So I think you've got the, the right coiffure for a, for a for a lovely atop the hat. Also, then, if you relook at the WhatsApp photograph, if I may, your daughter is a bit of a young Olivia Coleman lookalikey. Just thought I'd put that oh, I'll, have, I'll have to look back at that. Yeah, she, she more often gets um, uh, compared to the actor that was in... Um, Oh gosh, um, Queen's Gambit. Oh um, yes. In recent in recent times, there's uh, there's I've got a sort of like for like photograph. She does look very like that. Um, well, that's yeah. illustrious company either, indeed. Yeah, either comparison is good. It is, and in fact, the Queen's Gambit was one of my favourite binge watches of the entire pandemic. Mm -hmm. Actually, so thank you for that. So, hurrah, I'm going to be intrigued to ask you about your clearing because you've been to some of the most extraordinarily expansive vistas on the planet. So um, if I may ask you, what is a clearing? And I'm going to take you through, by the way, the clearing, the tree, alchemy gold, a cheeky bit of Shakespeare and a cake. So it's all to play for. But as you are um, a, a real, real intrepid explorer, I'm intrigued to know it, of everywhere you've been, Gordon Buchanan, MBE, gorgeous filmmaker, in the wilds, what it, where is a clearing? What is it like for you, metaphorically or literally? Um, I suppose literally, the the a place that I feel that everything is more straightforward, um, a place that I can reflect on on life is kind of pretty much anywhere on the the Isle of Mull where I I grew up. Um, I grew up on in Tobermory, which is the capital of the Isle of, of Mull. And um, Mull's not a particularly populated place. I think there's maybe sort of just short of two, 3,000 people living there. But um, I grew up there and without putting on rose tinted spectacles to look back at my childhood, it, it was a really idyllic way to uh, place to be to be brought up. Um, a lot of freedom, a lot of wild places to explore. And when I go back now, um, I just feel that I go into sort of a sort of transcend into a very different state of of being, and I I feel um, very relaxed and sort of um, yeah, kind of worries and concerns sort of tend to to melt away. Um, but it's sort of generally in a wilder places on the Isle of Mull, um, so places where I spent a lot of my my childhood. Um, I was lucky enough this summer to spend. Um, five days back up on on Mull um, and I was working so I wasn't with my family so in the time that between um, between work I was going off to places that I hadn't been since I was a kid and it's very um, quite haunting in a way there was one location that I went to that um, I hadn't been since I was maybe 10 years old um, and it was it was it was strange. It was it was wonderful to be there, but you can't help revisit somewhere like that. And when you're by yourself, to reflect on everything that's happened between sort of you know that day back in mid sort of you know or 1982 or whenever it was, and you know where we are sort of decades and decades later. Um, but it's yeah, it's a peaceful it's a peaceful place for anyone that visits Isle of Mull. But I think having grown up there and had sort of such sort of positive memories and and for that island to have really been a sort of springboard for me in life. Um, yeah, that's my that's my clearing. Lovely answer. So it, it represents a real homecoming for you. Wherever else you go, you come back to the Isle of Mull and Tobermory in, in its environment to find yourself again, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, uh, being with my family, being with my wife and kids, there's that that's my home and that's where I live. But and um, when I return to the island that I still really call home or my spiritual home on, on Mull, it's 
uh, it, 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 I've always been aware that it's, it was a magical place, and I still that magic is reignited when I when I visit again. Um, and thankfully, my, my um, most of my family still live there, so there's always good reason to um, to return there. So thank you for positioning that beautiful place so beautifully. So um, I'm going to arrive now with a tree, if I may, within your clearing. And um, we're in the Isle of Mull, but is there anywhere very specific you'd like to stand with this tree? On the lighthouse path, just about two miles out around the coast from um, from Sobermory, that was a place that was as wild as anywhere, any wild place on the earth could be. It was of a good yeah, sort of hour long walk as a small child to go through the woods to get there. And, and yeah, it's a place that is quite magical and it feels, yeah, feels as exotic as anywhere that I've been uh, in life subsequently. By the way, I absolutely love that uh, answer. Uh, have you read the book, The Lighthouse Keeper's Lunch, by the way? It's a really good kids book. No. So no, look no, at no. that. Look, look that up too. But anyway, I love the idea of being by this lighthouse. I love lighthouses. Fantastic. So uh, here I am now arriving with a tree and I'm going to shake your tree to see which storytelling apples fall out. And you were kind enough before we started to have thought about you had five minutes to think about four things that have shaped you, Gordon Buchanan, three things that inspire you, two things that never fail to grab your attention and borrow from the film up. Oh, that's a bit, oh, squirrels, you know, what never fails to whee, grab your attention. And then a quirky or unusual fact about you. And you can't now include the fact you're at the Bronte Centre putting on a top hat. Uh, a quirky or unusual fact about you we couldn't possibly know till you tell us. So this is your illustrious canopy to shake as you like. How do you like them apples? And over to you. Oh, things that have shaped me. I suppose um, I'll, I'll lump friends and family into one one apple because I, I'm fortunate enough that my family feel like friends and my friends feel like feel like family. Um, I, I think you know I've I've kind of kind of gone off grid in, in life um, compared to. A lot of my friends and, and family, but then um, they—it's really that early upbringing and and continued relationship with my friends and family that kind of, you know, keep me grounded, that make me laugh, that kind of, you know, that I'll always turn to when I have any concerns or, or worries in in life. And um, yeah, they are really the people that matter the matter the most. And you can have a fulfilling career, and you can do any number of exciting things in your day to day life or around the world, but um, I think just sort of realizing that you are, you know, you were made by other people. I don't just mean your parents. You were made by the people that um, who is sort of who you respect and admire, and who um, you know turned you into the person that you 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 started off with. You obviously, there's a lot of you know you can go your own way and become your own person and change and more morph as you go through life. But yeah, I think that kind of template of who I am. Um, is down to, to my, my friends and family and family and friends. Um, I an, an experience that really did shape me, I suppose, was after I got offered the, the job as, as, as Nick Gordon's assistant, I went to Sierra Leone in West Africa for a year and a half. Um, and at that point, I literally knew nothing. I'd never been abroad before I'd never been on a plane before I was not the the most naive 17 year old but I, when it came when it comes to sort of you know what the world is really like and and what sort of problems other people in other countries face I was was clueless um and I yeah left in January 1990 to go off to spend a year and a half in what was um the most poverty stricken country in the world at the, at the at the time and in that year i kind of as cliched as it sounds but it was my sort of you know transitional year and a half that i kind of started off as a 17 year old school boy and then by the end of the year i was sort of i was a man or grown up a lot um because i suppose because of the things that i was exposed to the level of responsibility that i that I had, but also I was on on my own for the first time. Really, um, I was with I was with Nick, but at that point, our friendship was kind of it, it was very much sort of master and apprentice. Um, yes. I'd left all of my friends and family um, behind, so that whole experience really did sort of 
shaped shaped me um as an adult um it was a kind of yeah very steep learning curve and a lot happened in a very short space of time and it, it sounds to me like that also you you talked about boy to manhood but the idea of giving you the encouragement of courage because there's lots of courage in what you do when you go as you say off grid more than many of your close friends might have done but there is a courage in going into the wilderness and and trusting your own resolve to be able to be courageous to be okay yeah I, thinking back on on, uh, on that time in my life, if I had a little button that I could push that could transport me back, uh, you know, to a year before, just before I said yes, I'll I'll do this, and um, there was many occasions I would have done that. It, it, I think a lot of people think, oh, this was an amazing opportunity for a seventeen-year-old, but my daughter, she's she's just seventeen, you know, she still feels so young and at that age no matter how grown up you you feel yeah. you really are still a kid and I you know I sort of felt a lot in that year and a half that I made a big mistake because I was I was really deeply unhappy and homesick uh because I was cut off from everything and everyone that I that I knew and I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that I persevered with it and the only reason that I did persevere was that Nick made me make one promise, which is that I would not welch on the deal, that I would see it out from start to finish and I wouldn't I wouldn't jump jump shit. So um yeah, I, I knew that I couldn't if I felt that morally there was no way I could have could have got out of it. And I'm glad that I glad that I didn't. It's all worked oh, out. So quite another well. value which you're percolating beautifully is loyalty. When you commit to something you you see it through. And I love that. And by the way, we're coming up at the very end, much later on, to, to invite you to give advice to your younger self. So it'll be very interesting what you do tell mm -hmm. your 17 year old self. And I love the fact that you wish you could press a button to go back there and have a word with yourself is what we'll explore later on. So we're still in your canopy. Have your we apples. got, yes, another something that has um, definitely shaped me um, is, um, I suppose, kind of my kind of working class roots. Um, it, uh, just recently in Zimbabwe, I was with my colleagues and everyone in the team were kind of from a sort of middle class um, upbringing background as, as my children are now. But I, I suppose I'm one of those people that have kind of working class upbringing, but have kind of become middle, middle class. And, a bit of social um, mobility. Yes, and yeah. it wasn't, you know, I kind of, I, I'm not trying to sort of falsely claim, um, you know, harsh upbringing of plead poverty, but we had a, a simple, a simple upbringing, and I'm really glad that I had that sort of, my upbringing, upbringing has given me a sort of a different perspective on life for a lot of people that I that I work with, um, because it sort of, yeah, I, I sort of, I think my levels of of empathy and understanding for for people have has, have been helped by you know the, the the type of family that I grew up in, and um, that's not to say obviously that people from middle class backgrounds sort of can't empathise, but I think you know I'm 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 in no way ashamed of of you know coming from a very simple basic uh, background. Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of but I'm not proud of the fact it's not something I kind of realise it's not something I actually talk about that that often because. The, there is this natural assumption, um, particularly with wildlife filmmaking, that everyone comes from a kind of middle class or upper middle class background. And certainly when I started, that was that was the case. There was not that many people from, you know, from backgrounds, the, the kind of background that I came from. So that sort of definitely that shaped me in a in a good in a good way, I feel. And, and by the way, I love the fact you use the word empathy because that was one of the qualities that so strikes me when you have the ability to wander into a pack of, you know, cheetah or be closer to polar bears than most would feel comfortable, obviously, uh, but have a, a, a delicious stillness, empathy and poise to you in your presence that, that you feel, I suppose, brave enough to sit there whilst, a, you know, a cheetah comes up and sniff shit or whatever it's doing mm -hmm. to, to get close to you. I mean, that's incredibly brave and intrepid, but it's, I think it's a power of empathy that makes the animal feel safe. Yeah. I think kind of, yeah, empathy is something that 
definitely guide you through life in a much sort of a less turbulent way. And that might be from working, meeting new people. Uh, it might be in sort of conflict that you have within sort of your, your family. Or it might be in bumping into a big scary wild animal. It's just having that ability to, you know, try and put your yourself in that other person or that other species mind and and look at the world from their perspective i think that's sort of not that i always succeed in doing that with people but i think certainly with animals it's it's a lot easier it's yes. a lot easier to imagine what did, what's that polar bear thinking and feeling right now than what's you know that person thinking or feeling right now and if i may because of the job that you do do you think you're more of a an animal whisperer or a person whisperer I think I'm. I think I'm. I've got both. Sort of, nice yeah, both pretty sorted. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I've got. I have many deficiencies and sort of things that I would, you know, uh, wish I could do better or know more about. But I think when it comes to understanding people and understanding animals, I think you know though, that's sort of that's my thing. That's what I do better than anything else that I do do. And we're going to come on to alchemy and gold later as well, which might be about, ask, well, it is about asking you when you're at your happiest. And I'll be interested just to bank that answer for later. Uh, OK, so now we're on to three things that have shaped you. Sorry, um, inspired, inspired you. me. Sorry, sorry. It's my programme. I should know what's going on. It's three things that inspire you. Sorry about that. Um, I suppose creativity of, of any sort, I always find really inspiring. So whether it's... Um, a movie, whether it's um, a, a painting, whether it's the way that someone speaks or a comedian, that's sort of, a, I'm always um, inspired by how people use their brains in a, a, in a non-academic way. Um, I, I think because I'm not an academic person myself, um, that I always have, you know, most admiration for for people that, that that create, and it could be something really sort of simple or straightforward. It could be something somebody said, just you know, a, a few words, and the way that somebody combines it, um, or the way that somebody can just use a few brush strokes to you know tell a story. That that really doesn't inspire me. Um, another thing, I suppose, and that sort of taps into this as well. Um, young young people inspire me. I, I kind of. I've spent the rest of a lot of my adult life waiting to waiting to grow up, um, and I suppose <laughs> it's only been maybe in the last sort of ten years that I've thought actually, as our kids are kind of approaching adulthood, or as our kids are approaching the the, the time of life that I thought I was an, an adult in the late teens, and I realised actually no, I must be I must be growing up now. Um, but I find young people really inspiring. I mean, like down to sort of babies, the sort of simple joy and innocence of a baby, I, I find really inspiring. Um, I just thought that really, it really lifts me. I don't know if inspiration is a right, sort of, but yeah, it is. It, it, that's the right way I could have, it, it sort of puts the kind of wind under my, my wings. Or it could be, you know, the enthusiasm that young people have for anything. Um, you know, listening to young people talk about their passions in, in life, I find really um, uplifting and inspiring. Um, and I think that's something that sadly a lot of a lot of adults tend to to lose in life is that sort of lust for life and that enthusiasm. Um, and yeah, you get that more commonly in young people or certainly the adults that I gravitate towards are those that have those kind of childlike qualities or childlike enthusiasm um, and, and love for love for life. Um, another, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a given, I suppose, that, that nature is something that inspires me um, in all of its complexities, in its simplicity. There is just so much inspiration to be drawn from the natural world and we get i suppose it's sort of times are cloudy because we think about the planet and the climate we think about nature we think about being under attack we think of its fragility and vulnerability but but what makes it special is its um its ability to to inspire us and it could be something from you know, the tiniest of 
of insects or a spider spinning a web or it could be an elephant shaking a shaking a tree to get the pods raining down on it that's sort of in itself is inspiring and um, I mean sitting looking out over this bay there's huge waves crashing in and I kind of realized that I grew up by the sea and I really do I miss it and I find a single wave in, inspiring just watching it roll in and build and and just how um I suppose powerful but unpredictable it can uh, waves can be by the way I love that your waves of inspiration roiling in on us I love that this is all really good boom so now to curate the conversation and get a tiny bit of a look on we're in no hurry at all this is timing itself beautifully two things now that never fail to whoop, grab your attention if there's any overlap in what we've been talking about don't worry about that they can overlap but uh, what two things never fail to grab your attention please roadkill <laughs> <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> <laughs> I have, um, I, wherever I drive, anywhere in the world, I, I, I must be looking out for it because I will spot anything that has been killed by uh, the roadside. You know, partly it's sort of, I'm always looking, looking around as I'm driving through any environment, I'll be looking at sort of the habitats, how it changes, I'll be looking at the weather, but something I sort of do that does seem to catch my attention is, you know, the things sadly, that are dead at the side of the road. Um, and in many cases, as, as sad as that is, in some cases, uh, you, you can take some encouragement out of, of seeing those animals, even in that condition, because it lets you know that they are, they're around. Um, yes. So if you drive through the Highlands of Scotland, um, I spent a, about a year and a half up around Strath's Bay, and as sad as it was to see, you, you frequently would see roe deer dead at the side of the road, mountain hare, grouse, um, uh, hedgehogs, pine martens. But 25 years later, you still see um, those animals. So it's just sadly the way that we've changed their environment means that there's sort of, there are a few, a few casualties. Um, but often it's an opportunity for me to add to my skull collection, which, um, yeah, it's sort of something that I have done in the past is um, leapt out. And if, if the carcass is in a suitable, a suitable state of decomposition and the head will easily <laughs> come off, I will, I will take that for my collection. And I've got a nice, a nice little um, yeah, array of, of um, skulls from different British mammals, mostly. I like that. So don't be asleep by the side of the road. Gordon Buchanan can pull your head off. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> For, uh, yeah, so it's the equivalent of a biologist, I suppose, with a, with a glass case in a museum where you've sort of uh, noticed the species are around, but you've just stuffed them in the metaphorical cabinet of observation, I suppose. Yes, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, um, it is something that I'm always questioning what, you know, which animals are living in any of the habitats that I happen to be, to be passing through. Um, and it, yeah, I... I if we're on a long drive with my family, I'm I'm just sort of shouting out, "Raw deer, hedgehog!" And the the kids, I said, "Did you see it?" And they said, "Dad, you keep on just pointing out dead stuff. Why do we want to see a beautiful animal dead at the side of the road?" And and they do have a point. Well, taxidermy is always a hobby for later as well. If you pull <laughs> off more than the head. Now a quirky, I, th I think that was too uh, quirky or unusual fact. So now uh, about what never fails to grab your attention. Now a quirky or unusual fact about you. That was quite unusual what you just said, but is there anything else? I did, I did think that was, yeah, kind of my skull collection was, yeah, unusual. But I've, I've spoken about that before. Um, this, I, yeah, I suppose my kind of quirky, unusual fact uh, about me that you would not tell from looking at me is that I am... Uh, I'm a super recognizer. Um, I have got a, a, a unique ability to remember faces. Um, I didn't know that I had this ability. <laughs> as as, use, as useless as it may be as a superpower, I always said to my wife, I said, if, um, if I have a superpower, it is my ability to remember faces. Um, but it was actually, it was, a, it was one of those online forms that I filled out. It said, are you a super recognizer? And I thought, oh, I'll fill this out. Um, and this is a number of years ago. And I'm sort of now part of a, an ongoing study. I think it's the University of Greenwich that is, that, that is exploring uh, people's, people's powers of, of recognition. 
Um, so every sort of three months or so, I get a new test to see, um, yeah, kind of where my skill is at. And it's got progressively harder um, as these tests go on, but it's it's kind of, it's become a bit of a, bit of a hobby for me. I always try and score really highly. Um, as inconsequential as it may be in life, just to remember people's faces. I mean, it, it's handy, but... Um, no, and and yeah. if I may, I can give you a test of that when I try and come and see your show in February. And if you sort of <laughs> walk straight past me and go, I'll think, yeah, that was me, Captain Underwell. <laughs> Damn it. There goes my excuse. Brilliant. And you can say, well, the test was getting harder and you were quite boring, is what you can say. <laughs> OK, we've shaken your tree on what a majestic canopy that was. Now we are staying within the clearing, moving away from the tree. And I'd like to talk about alchemy and gold now, if we may. So um, when you're at purpose and in flow, Gordon Buchanan, the wonderful wildlife filmmaker and presenter that you are, what are you most happy doing? I, I love just being sort of slumped in front of the television with my wife and, and kids. Um, I think it's just, uh, it is a really happy place for me to be, just to be, yeah, together with my, my family. It, or, I mean, slumped in front of the TV, that's not, that's, not, that's not great. But if we're playing a game together, we don't, you know, if we go on holiday, um, we always play cards together. And at Christmas time, we'll always play board games as a family. And I love that. That's kind of my happiest, happiest place. And um, I mean, I could say I get, you know, completely lost in in natural events. If I'm filming a, a wild animal, um, you know, a leopard hunting or, you know, following gorilla a gorilla family through um through the jungles in a sort of remote um forest in, in the congo that um, I, I, makes me very happy but i know at the back of my mind um you know i'm sort of, i feel that i'm neglecting my my family so there's sort of you know there's a contentment but i suppose a, a 360 kind of 100 percent happiness is sort of only really there when i'm with um wendy and the kids I love that um, through all of this, you are innately a home bird and there's sort of a warm half home calling by the rug mm -hmm. of the fire and the card games and the board games. Lovely. So that's your alchemy in gold. And now a um, little bit of Shakespeare now. Inspired by Shakespeare's All the World's a Stage, this is the point where I'm going to give you a cake, which I know doesn't sound Shakespearean of itself. But in awarding you with a cake, um, first of all, do you like cake? I like cake of, of all sorts, really. So you get to choose the cake flavour of choice and then we make it a multi-layered cake in a way that I'll describe. So what okay. sort of cake would you like, Gordon Buchanan? Well, I, I, I'm in France at the moment and there are way too many patisseries on any number of streets that for, for anyone with a kind of slight sugar addiction. So I find myself actually having to avoid cake shops. But yesterday I had something that I had never had before. It was a, an eclair. A coffee, a coffee eclair. So I like, yeah, anything with a coffee-ish of taste, I, I like. But this eclair was just, it wasn't some kind of measly kind of little sort of thread of filling. This was a big fat sausage roll eclair with coffee icing on top filled with like a kind of coffee ganache, kind of cream oh. type of thing. I'm going to so say that's... E easy, Tiger. That's a heck of a cake there, because yeah. I'm now going to give you a cherry to put on the cake, if I may. But thank you for that <laughs> delicious nom 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 description. So now the, the cherry on the cake is the legacy of our conversation. I'll return to the Shakespeare in a minute. But this is where I'm going to invite you to um, answer stuff like, um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? And or and including what's your favourite inspirational quote that's always given you sucker and pulled you towards your future? What advice would you maybe proffer to a younger, maybe 17 year old version of yourself? And then finally, to reincorporate the Shakespeare inspired by all the world's stage and all the men and women merely players. You can doff on your top hat uh, as we do a Victorian version of Shakespeare. And uh, can you now also then include it in that, give us legacy and how, when all is said and done, you'd most like to be remembered. So it's multi-layered, over to you. Um, I suppose inspirational quotes, I'm never very good at remembering remembering quotes, but sort of, um, you know, wise wise words from from people, I do tend to, to remember. And, and Nick Gordon, 
who was my boss and sort of plucked me sort of from, from school at the age of 17 and gave me this amazing opportunity. And um, he was, I suppose, the first adult, or f- the first m- bloke that I had met that was um, not afraid, I suppose, to kind of, um, you know, go off in flights of fancy. Um, I grew up in a fishing community. Um, you know, my dad wasn't around, so I was, you know, that it was a lot of hardy, sort of hard drinking, hard talking um, fishermen, hard working fishermen, uh, and anything, uh, any sort of, you know, revealing any emotions was seen as sort of, you know, effeminate. So nobody ever really opened opened up. And and Nick, um, yeah, was the first man that I, you know, would sort of talk with with passion about about things. So I think, you know, in the early days when I first met him, you know. Uh, I remember he said this was probably the first quote. He was like, "You, you can, you can reach to the stars. You might only get as far as the moon, but that's sort of better than where you are right now." And that always stuck with me. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think when it comes to, you know, advice. Yeah, I, I remember sort of the best advice. Someone saying the best advice is not to take advice from from anyone. Um, but at the start of my presenting career, um, bearing in mind this wasn't something that I kind of naturally wanted to do. It was sort of it, the opportunity fell in my lap and I thought I should I should take it and see where it where it goes. Um, but I didn't have any great desire to be in in front of the in front of the camera. And I was sort of, you know, at the beginning when I first started filming myself, I wasn't being filmed, but I started filming myself. And I found that quite easy because I would just, you know, it was like a video diary. Um, but then with the more presented pieces, when, you know, I had to get some point across and it wasn't just off off the top of my head thinking, I really struggled with that. Cause I was trying to think, okay, what 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 would a wildlife presenter do? How would, um, you know, how would a wildlife presenter say this uh, and my wife at the time who works in NTV and had um she'd worked with a lot of different presenters at that point she said just be yourself just be yourself and nothing else and if that's not good enough this isn't the job for for you wow. yeah, yeah. um so I, yeah I mean I could have I could have maybe had a, a a short a shorter career if I tried to be someone else or try to do it in the way that other people do it but um I, I've sort of seen it as a you know an asset over the years is just kind of do it in my own way and, and try and kind of uh, be true to myself and not try and change myself overly overly much yeah just kind of be yourself that's the easiest thing in life the speech. lovely the lovely quote is be yourself because everyone else is taken yeah exactly so I love that. brilliant okay so legacy how would you most like to be remembered when all is said and done um, you know, I'm not, I'm not too fussed about, you know, being, being remembered, um, really, I've sort of, I, on the way here, on the flight from Paris to, um, to Bordeaux the other day, we had to make an emergency landing, oh. and the, 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 <laughs> the passengers seemed very, very relaxed. But the air, the cabin crew were running about sort of as if this was their last minute on air. And in the panic, they only gave an, a, a French version of what, what the situation was. So I was saying, I thought, this is not the, the time to ask for a, a translation into English. They seem to have enough on their hands. As it turned out, the, the, the cockpit had filled up with smoke and the back of the, the cabin um, had filled up with smoke. But I knew it was serious, and and I kind of sat there and I thought, oh shit! And we were low enough, um, you know. I still I picked up my phone and there was a phone signal, and and I just thought, well, what what could I, what could I do if this is if wow. this is it? What could I do? And I just um yeah, I just sent a quick message to my wife and kids, just saying, you know that I love you. So I suppose that was that was wow. that was it. That was enough enough to stay. And I could have contacted anyone else, or I could have sent you know. Yeah, any other, but I, I was very aware of the, the fact that like, oh, that's that's the only thing that's really important to me. And um, that extends to, you know, my, my friends and, and family, I suppose. I want them to realise um, how much I value them. Um, I, I think as far as sort of 
legacy through my work and the programs that I've made in another, you know, I'm glad that people enjoy them when they go out and I'm really glad that they continue to repeat them. But in another 10 years, they'll all be forgotten and they won't, you know, they won't be shown again. And that's fine with, with me. Um, I'm not sort of, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not like Markham and Wise are going to be reeling out Gordon Buchanan programs um, <laughs> every, every Christmas. Um, and that's, that's fine. So I think as long, I'm, I'm just, uh, hopefully, when it comes to work, if there are people that have been inspired by the programs that I've been involved in, um, and, and that is what has set them on a course to try and do some good in the world, whether it's to work in conservation, or, you know, um, campaign for, against, for environmental issues, that's, you know, that's good in the, in the here and now. Um, but yeah, I suppose I only really matter to the people that I'm sharing the planet with at the, at the moment and long term, it tickles me a little bit that, you know, 50, 100 years from now, that there may be some sort of dusty little hard drive somewhere that some, <laughs> someone in the future can say, oh, that was my great, great grandfather. That was a quite a cool job that he, that he had. Um, so, yeah, that would be more than enough. You know that I love you. It's not me talking to you, but that's your quote. You know that I love you. And you know, that was a lovely job that man did all those years ago. Wonderful. So very quickly, we're overrunning very, very slightly, but I don't think that matters. So uh, just where can we find out more about your tour and about Gordon Buchanan on the Internet? Um, there's so on my Instagram page, that, and which is, I'm going to have to remind myself of it. It's Gordon Buchanan underscore wildlife but I suppose if you anyone searches on Instagram um Gordon Buchanan wildlife filmmaker I, I think I'm the, the sort of top Gordon Buchanan involved in wildlife filmmaking at the moment of course you are. Um, and there's a link in the description um there for tickets for my talk tour that I'm doing at the end of end of January there's also a website that's gordon-buchanan.co.uk and that gives links to all of the the locations and um for the talk to us. It's a whole that it's the whole month of February I'm going to be on the road visiting different theatres, um, boring people to tears, hopefully not. But um it it it's um, something I've really I've done to these talk tours before, but this is an opportunity to really um you know talk about my a career that has spanned 30, you know, 30 years of you know, three decades that I've been doing this job and and what what is ordinary for me um, I suppose it is out of the ordinary for a lot of Indeed, a lot of yes. people, and um, so it gives me this opportunity to meet sort of the people that you know watch the programs that I'm you know I love I love making and and actually sort of hearing what they're interested in and tell them a lot of you know a lot of the stuff that doesn't actually make it into the programs. By the way, I, I sincerely love your humility. Your MBE was for services to conservation and wildlife filmmaking. So uh, I think your reputation will live on far longer than you appreciate. And we'd like you for that. Um, so uh, what's your tour called? I know obviously you're called Gordon Buchanan, but have you got a title of the tour that we need to look out for? It's um, I think it's Gordon Buchanan 30 Years Wild. I think, yeah. Yes. Let me just check. I'm going to double check that. Well, are we, and also, is... I need to close the programme soon because of the length of the show for UK Health Radio. But with your permission, hang on, because we'll do something else immediately afterwards. But you have been listening to the wonderment that is Gordon Buchanan. This is your moment in the sunshine, Gordon. Is there anything else you'd like to say as a result of having been here? No, I mean, it's quite, it's nice to actually speak to someone because I've actually been alone for most of the past <laughs> week and I realised that how much I've missed human company. So thank you. You're very welcome. So this has been your time in the sunshine with me, Chris Grimes, your life and times with me, Grimes. This has been Gordon Buchanan. Thank you for watching on Facebook too. We've multimedia straddled the universe. I'll stop recording there. To your good health and goodbye.